Rebel Love Show. I am Rob Rebel. We are airing live. Today is October 27th, 2013. Uh, you can find me at Voluntary Rebel on Twitter, uh, facebook.com slash the Rebel Love Show. And today's co-host is none other than Joel Valenzuela. Uh, he is the new mover to the uh, Free State Project, editor at the Desert Links. How's it going, Joel? I'm doing just fantastic. Mostly due to the fact that I'm on the show. <laughs> well, me too. Mm. So, uh, New Hampshire, how is it? Well, it's pretty good today. Finally, it's finally cold enough to break break out the sweater vest and the pea coat, which is I don't know. I, I miss the cold weather, so I like it. There you it's go. Really you're, looking, well. you're looking very trendy, very hipsterish. Is that a thinly veiled insult. No, no, no. You're 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 a young guy compared to me. You can you can be trendy. I can't be trendy. I'm too old to be trendy nowadays. Hey, you never outgrow, never outgrow classiness. I, I I suppose so. I suppose so. So what's uh? Give me a give me a status report on one month in on uh, the Free State Project for you. How's how's it feel? Well, it's been really great. I've been here almost a month. Um, the thirtieth will make it a month. And so far, it's pretty, it's pretty epic. It's um, the real strength of this place is the community of people that moved out here, and the the connections. It's kind of a, it's really it's, I guess it separates you know you use the old biblical comparison separates the wheat from the chaff. It sort of separates the people who just talk about what's wrong with the world today and the people who are prepared to do anything about it. And I guess you could do something from anywhere in the world, but it seems like the people who try really resolve to do something great to change this world all came right here. And then when you're around, when you're a mover, and I don't mean movers and you move to the free state, but when you're a mover and you move things, you're not just a talker. When you're a mover and you get together with other movers, great things tend to happen. Well, FSP did reach uh, 15,000 signers uh, the other day. Is that like a huge thing for uh, everyone there that's already uh, moved? Oh, yeah, it's huge. It's, what, three quarters of 20,000? Didn't, so they didn't they just get uh, – didn't uh, Free State Project just get uh, – how many movers? 1,400 now? About Early that. movers, something like that. Man, I remember when it was like 900, like at the beginning of the year. Yeah, it's you know? crazy. My first week – at, there was a new movers party, and there was a, a over a dozen. There's like 14, 15 people just who moved that week, and so it's the momentum is really starting to pick up. And each new milestone is going to be more and more until finally, you know. Well, they have that momentum going in. Like, I mean, they've almost doubled how many people they already have moved in a in a year, and that's before it even reached the goal of twenty thousand for the even start the move. Um, yeah, I, to me, I mean, you know, I'm a Free State Project participant, so I'm exactly. I'm jealous you got there before I did. So I hope well, to be there sooner rather than later. But you're still gonna get there in time to be one of the early people because there's a few like there's there's a few of the, the original Keen crowd, especially who got there way before anyone, and there was nothing to code to. They just came, and it was another place, and they had to start this whole alternative. Um, system by themselves. They had to start the whole, there was no activism scene. There was no like agorist scene. There was nothing that they just had to come just start from nothing. And now there's actually something to go to, especially in Manchester. I mean, Keene is still what people think about when they think about the free state project, but Manchester actually has more free staters and a bigger, um, bigger activism center. Well, what 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 are uh, what are Manchester Free Staters up to? What's going on in Manchester? Well, um, just today I sort of bailed, <laughs> but there was a trash pickup thing going on on the highway. Organized. I by saw photos on Facebook of that. It turned out really well, and there's a little bit of a stir right now because today they rolled out the bear cap because there was some shooting. Just about literally, I mean, quite literally a stone's throw from where I am right now. And some, there's some shooting, and it was between, it was two minors that were involved. And it seems like that's enough to roll out the SWAT team and have the Bearcat hit the streets. 
Was it anybody shot, or was it just a shooting? It was a kid shot, and the other one is up. Well, last I heard, was still up there. And instead of, I mean, then I, did, I didn't know uh, Manchester had a Bearcat. I knew Keene and now Concord did. I didn't know they already had one in Manchester. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, this, you know, the reports I heard, but it's, you know, it's it's more who doesn't have one these days. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I noticed like almost now it's like every time I uh, read the news, like some some city somewhere, some small town American city has a tank now. Uh, why? I have no idea, but well, I, I do have an idea why. But um, it's well, amazing. How, it's amazing how many people like go along with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not really it's not really something that's a very useful thing to have for a police department. It's not like it finds a lot of use. Well, not... it is if they're fighting terrorists, like they consider it a free state project. Well, even terrorists and stuff, from what I've heard, it's not a very um, IED resistant vehicle. And it's not like, it's not a wartime vehicle. It's just an armored thing that's meant to look scary and oh my gosh. And it's, for the most part, if you have something your normal SWAT team can't handle, then it's probably going to be beyond the Bearcat too. But it's more of a look at us and our big tank, and then it's it's more it's just an excuse thing. It's that's the thing. It's not even a real it's not even a real need. And if it were a need, it's not even a good um, and a good means to that to the end of keeping the people safe. Well, purportedly, it's just a pork barrel spending kind of thing. It's like we want our, our tank just because we want our tank. Sort of yeah. like a lot of big cities want a a light rail system or some public transportation system like that just so they can feel like a big city. And it did just complete like Phoenix did that a few years ago. And it was a very expensive project to build a light rail. And in fact, they estimated that it could buy every family a new car for the price that it took to build this thing, excluding fares, etc. And I, you know, I happen to like public transportation, but I was, I used this light rail a few times while I lived in Phoenix. And it just is not that useful. You can't use it to go to work. It's not. It's just whenever there's a game downtown, or like the Diamondbacks are playing, you just everyone jumps on the light rail. Other than that, there's just it's just no one uses it. It's just a huge waste, just because the city felt like they needed this vestige of I don't know, progress, societal progress, and the Bearcats are probably like that too. Well, like we'll change the subject over to uh, but the Bearcats have been more than covering the Free State Project, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, like my whole thing was, I, I was going a little rant about public transportation. Um, yeah. Now, see, I I use public. I mean, I'm in Chicago. It's mm -hmm. it's hard to use a car around here. We like to use it from time to time. Now, my my thing is, I wish it wasn't public. I wish it was private. I wish that there was a competing bus services and competing train services and whatnot. Instead of, I mean, they're technically some of them are tentatively considered. Well, it depends. In, in Chicago, there's two different bus uh, companies. There's mm -hmm. a CTA and there's PACE. Uh, CTA is actually the Chicago Transit Authority, um, but then there's PACE, which r operates all in the uh, in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, they're only there because of uh, you know wheeling and dealing with uh, government authorities, where there isn't any competition that's allowed to, to come in. They're the only game in town. So in reality, I mean, it's it's public, but it's it's not. I, Exactly. I I wish there was like competition in it because you know it would, yeah and there is I mean in some cities there have been private bus systems that have been created and have been very effective and cheap until the government gets involved and shuts them down. There and, there was there was a uh, I'm, I'm I don't have the the article in front of me but I know I think it was in Florida somewhere um, technically it, it's. Uh, they just like most cities, so, you know, you can't have. They don't allow competition in the market. So these uh, college students had like this great idea to rent a tr uh, a bus that truck or whatnot that would have a huge billboard on it, one of those like uh, moving billboards or whatnot that you see on the roads. And uh, but there was also a bus, and they were offering rides for free. But they made that back in ad revenue alone just by driving that truck around with the advertisement and they got shut down because they were stealing profit away from the city because no one was using the city bus everyone was using them because it was free and they were making money off of it because all they were was selling advertisement 
Yeah, well, it sounds like the American dream. And like every good dream, there's always some asshole to wake you up from it, right? Yeah. I mean, they here here you go, like a couple of young entrepreneurs coming up with like some great idea, something that you know it's not really done, offering a free service and making money at the same time. And uh, apparently the city didn't like that and shut it down. I, I forgot the name of the, which city in Florida it is, but mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Um, well, as for public transportation, and again, drawing back to my Arizona experience, there's the super shuttle for that goes from. I mean, it's been called different things before, and there's a few of them. They go between um, the border, Douglas or Aguaprieta, on the Mexican side. They go to Phoenix and stop in Tucson, Sierra Vista, etc. And that's the most it's a very reliable, very good way of just getting up and back through between the cities. And it's, I mean, I've written, I've written it several times before. It's a really quick, efficient thing. And it's, it's basically run by a couple of Mexican entrepreneurs. Basically, no, none of the passengers ever speak English on that thing. It's an entirely um, entrepreneurial thing set up for Mexican migrant workers. And as far as I know, the state hasn't gotten really involved at all. And so that's why it's so efficient and it just works really well. Anytime you're in Phoenix and need to get down to the border, we can good six hour drive, um, four hour drive, good four hour drive. Instead of trying to figure out old car, whatever, if you have no ride, you can just hop on the super shuttle. They leave like every half hour, hour and just, there we go. All because of the market. Yeah, no, for sure. So, um, are you going to go to, uh, have you explored uh, New Hampshire besides just being in Manchester? Uh, a little. Uh, I work in Bedford, which is now skirts. I work in Derry, too, another sort of suburb. I've been up to Ware, which is northwest. I've been up to Concord. I've been to uh, Newmarket, Hampton, and Portsmouth, the whole seacoast area. So I've, I've probably hit about a good quarter to third of the state so far. Just you know, west. Gonna, are you going to go to uh, the Keenvention next week? Actually, not because I'm going to be in Boston for the Students for Liberty conference promoting the Free State Project. Oh, well, that's a it's a worthy ex uh, reason not to go to that, I suppose. Exactly. I would have. You know, I'm going to be tabling for the Free Staters. So, I mean, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, all the good work we're doing here, it's all, it really helps to just keep up the for lack of a better word, the evangelism, spreading the gospel, the good word of the free state. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, here's here's <laughs> something that I always kind of was, uh, always thought about. Like, I, I can always relate to um, someone who's very religious and feels like they need to spread the word of God. Because, mm -hmm. um, like, most people that get this far down the rabbit hole in regards to liberty and self ownership and all that jazz, and they, you know, they sign up for a free state project, they feel the need that they got to tell everyone. They got to tell everyone in the world what it is and why, you know, you know, why you should embrace liberty instead of statism and all that jazz. Uh, what, what's your take on that? Am, am well, I wrong that we kind of like act as if we're very religious, but we're not? Well, it's something that we definitely believe and in one way it parallels religion in seeing the different world the world through a different worldview than other people. And as for the evangelism thing, as far as generically the philosophy of liberty goes, um, the message we're spread we're spreading is mostly kind of a downer message, which is this world that you see that you think is kind of okay. It's like look how awful everything is. It's kind of a downer message. But that's why I love the Free State Project because this is the hope. This is the positive side of that whole thing. This is where people are actually going and getting things done outside of the state. This is where, this is where you can. This is the proverbial gulch, gulch, where you can actually see what the world can be like, you know, when we operate outside of coercive action. And so that's that's the message. I mean, as much as I'd love to just talk about liberty all day long to other people. This this specific part of the message of liberty that there is a place where stuff is happening. That's the thing that's worth spreading. That's the good, the actual, literal good news. This is the Free State Project is the good news in the sea of darkness. I I, I completely agree. Like you know, like for me, my whole uh, my whole transition from uh, being a you know a, a statist to being down, going down the conservative rabbit hole from my perspective, all the way down into the Free State Project. Mm -hmm. um, 
you can only learn about how bad things are and how bad the government is to a point where like, all right, now what? Well, the Free State Project and whatnot is, and the, the message of liberty is the now what? You know, like, okay, now I know everything's bad, but what? You know, what do I go? Where do I go from here? Um, yeah. But I, I agree. Uh, if you're a liberty, uh, you know, if you have liberty at your heart, you know, you, you've embraced the non-aggression principle as your uh, philosophical guidelines. Um, you need to get to New Hampshire as soon as you can. Um, so uh, here's a here's a question. Now this has kind of been like out of the news lately for the most part. Um, right. What's your thoughts on what's going to happen to Adam Kokesh? Because didn't his lawyer quit or like uh, stop? Um, not quit, but uh, is no longer representing him. I and mean, like, he just like pleaded. He no. just now pleaded in, uh, not guilty, like on the twenty fourth or whatnot, and um, which is like months after he was even arrested. Uh, I don't know, man. I have, I don't I don't have high hopes for him. There's a there's a lot of stuff going on with that whole thing. A lot of a lot of private issues between him and his staff and his friends, et cetera, that I'm just I'm not gonna be in touch. Well, I don't wanna get in touch I don't wanna get into the whole subject of yeah, his drama on his team. I'm just talking about you know, whether or not he's ever gonna uh how you know soon he's gonna get out of a cage for, you know, possessing a firearm in Freedom Plaza in the capital of the free country on the planet named the United States. Well, all I can I can follow my gut feeling. My gut feeling is he's going to be away for a long time, but not too long. Just long enough for people to start forgetting who he was again. And then this is just long enough so that he's not just back at it in a second. And, you know, it's like, like he never doesn't skip a beat. They're going to make him skip a beat. And then he's going to get out and then see what he can piece together from his life from there, I guess. Well, I'm, I'm sure he'll be – I'm not worried about him when he gets out. I'm sure he'll be fine when he gets out. Um, but, uh, especially with his lawyer, uh, not represent him anymore. And in fact, it took them that long to do this. I think they're going to try and unfortunately make a, uh, you know, uh, an example out of him and put him away for a few years. Unfortunately, it's sad to see. Well, I know. I mean, they, they've already put him away. Uh, they had him in solitary confinement for like a what, month, two months, uh, how he's a dangerous person where, you know, uh, yeah. People that do violent crimes get in there actually for a shorter amount of time. I mean, he's already served a long period of time as it is. Exactly. And with my um, experience in the whole uh, public relations realm, it seems like it's a very carefully, very carefully crafted stance. You can't be too mean to the guy because then all of a sudden he's a martyr. And you can't be too easy on him where he encourages other people. There's that midway point that they're aiming at where they make sure they're just hard enough on him to come to – dissuade anyone from doing the same thing he did, but then they're not quite mean enough so someone can say, oh, look, he was right. Look, the system is yada yada. They, they're they picking exactly the perfect little option for that, and you know, which I which any fool would have known would have happened. Yeah, you know, so yeah. I think that his fate um, in that terms is just not much. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I I just don't think his fate is that much up in the air as far as, well, what if this, what if that? It's like, we, we know what's going to happen. This has happened before. Like, um, I'm reminded of Ir Irwin Schiff, the illustrious Peter Schiff's father, for no one cared about his tax evasion. It was when he started encouraging others to do the same publicly that he became a threat, and they just got rid of him for basically ever. And that basically... Yeah. His son has not followed in his father's footsteps to the same degree because of that, because it's like, okay, it's not time yet that we can do that. Well, I mean, I, I think anyone that does tax evasion should be held up as a hero, in my opinion, because they're literally standing up against the state saying, come and take it. You know, um, yeah. I understand why some people pay taxes. I get it, because, you know, you don't want to be – kidnapped at gunpoint and throw in a cage for holding on to your own property. You know, I mean, it's, it is what it is. Um, unfortunately, the average person in this country thinks that tax evasion is a horrible crime that needs punishment. Uh, you know, that I can, I never got over that. I can, yeah. I know even at my, 
we, even when I was still a you know statist, because uh, everyone's a statist you know beforehand. Um, even when I was a statist, I still believed that you know taxation was wrong, that it's theft, and that it shouldn't happen. But I still believe somehow we can fund our government through other means. Uh, well, but, and yes, and we can, and that's the point that um, all these services, these world, these services for society to function properly are all possible through voluntary means. And I know there's a lot of nice, normal, um, really reasonable you know, people, liberty lovers, who still say, I don't mind paying taxes because I don't mind doing my part for society, etc. And they're absolutely right. What they don't quite grasp is that, well, if you don't mind paying taxes, then why don't you, why don't we pay it voluntarily? And that's the, that's the big, the big, um, test is up here in the Free State Project with people building communities that they're, they're operating outside of the whole governmental system. It's a test to see how well that thing can work and how well, like, how well can dispute, dispute resolution work, how well can people fund public works of any kind, all that without a coercive hand of the government. And as soon as that gets proven, watch how quickly coercive government goes away. Well, we need to get more people there before that can happen. Um, mm -hmm. We definitely need to get more people there. Now, here, here's a question. I, I see people in the Free State Project and even self-proclaimed voluntarists and mm -hmm. anarchists and whatnot still participating in the system because, they, because there actually can be uh, – New Hampshire is one of the very few places where like, the political process can kind of work in your favor sometimes. Like some things do change. Mm -hmm. um, where do you take on that? Would you ever vote in elections in New Hampshire? Well, yes, I definitely would because it's a tool that's available to us. It's like, I mean, it's it's not like, I don't really, and I disagree with a lot of, I guess, more anarchist types on this stance. That I don't think there's anything wrong with voting when it's there. I, as in, I think that there is something wrong with the ability to vote <laughs> once we have it, just using it or not, because no one, the statement that people make by not voting supposedly, no one hears that. They just listen to, you know, they just count the votes as a legitimization of whatever they're doing. And so, for example, votes for, you know, the proverbial or the real Ron Paul, for example, mm -hmm. is big, it's a, it's a big public unavoidable um, voice of, dis of a disdain for the powers that be, and it's not. It's something different when you say, "Oh well, you all, you know, you have terrible." There's always that argument of, "Oh well, you complain about everything, but you all voted for this guy." It's like, "Well, no, we didn't." Well, well, you didn't vote for anyone else, so everyone who voted, who cared, voted for this guy, and what he's doing, that must be the will of the people, and. A silent voice is not necessarily a voice sometimes, and so for that, for that reason, I believe that as long as voting is available to us, and it's not a lesser of two evils kind of thing, then we should use it at least to just throw a monkey wrench in the whole process. I somewhat agree. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, federally wise, I don't think I'd ever vote in a federal election ever again. Like, I, I regret voting for Gary Johnson. Uh, that was before I kind of I was trying to still hold on to that last uh, that last hope. And after I did so, uh, the wife yelled at me about like, "How could you even do that?" I'm, like, I, I'm right. I, I shouldn't have done it. Um, but uh, I could see um, locally voting in some some instances. I would have a very high threshold of where I would participate. Um, I would vote for any person running in New Hampshire that's part of the New Hampshire Independence Party where, like, you know, advocating secession. Um, yeah. I, w I, would, I would go against my belief in voting and vote. You know what I'm saying? It's like, all right, mm -hmm. all right, I'll, I'll do it. Or anyone running on a, um, like, some sort of educational platform exactly. where, like, they're, you know, just them on the ballot is going to wake other people up. Uh, because that in itself is going to uh, give you know more people uh, 
uh, notice to those ideas that they would never have done. So it's really hard for me to say don't ever vote. Um, and I, now, first off, we're going to get, you know, we're both going to get bashed on this because you never can be too, you can never be anarchist enough for everyone. Um, yeah. But, uh, enough for anyone on the other flip side of the coin. Yeah, yeah. Um, no matter what you say, no matter where you are, you're not, you're not pro liberty enough for some folk. Um, but, uh, no, I would support, if they're running on, in a local race, the, uh, running on the platform, removing the position that they're running for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I would probably participate. But for the most part, I really wouldn't. It depend, It really depends on the situation. Um, I don't yeah. see – I would help campaign for certain uh, people, but I don't know if I would vote unless it's it – it would have to be a very strong, compelling argument for me to yeah. do so. Well, um, depends on how – if you – I don't believe voting is ever objectionable as long as the result of your vote, the result of the person you elected, you voted for getting into office, as long as that results in a net positive to liberty, as long as that rolls back the size and scope of government, it's a worthy little endeavor to just walk into the, you know, sacrifice half a day to walk into the damn polling booth and just push a button. Because it's big, you know, otherwise it's other people are going to be doing that. Now, if for some reason, if I know, I understand some people don't want to get their hands dirty that much. They don't want to say, well, I I, I don't want to vote for this guy who's going to be great for liberty, but he's going to oppose, um, he's going to he's going to oppose regulationless marijuana legalization or some other thing like that. That is, and he's going to actually not be a perfect. And I can't I can't have that tied. In. I can understand that. And if that's your position. Then write in Lysander Spooner. Write in Jesus. Jesus was a great guy. Just I wouldn't vote. Who wouldn't vote for Jesus, right? And he's wow. not gonna he's not gonna come and claim a official elected office. And at least that's that statement of, you know, when they're tallying up the votes, it's like okay, we have you know four hundred thousand for Jesus. We have six hundred and seventy eight thousand for Mitt Romney's distant cousin. Whatever. Who cares? At least it's it's a it's something on paper that at least is an eyesore for the powers that be. They look at all these people for voting for this guy who's been dead for thousands of years. I mean, that's I, I kind of like the sound of that. It's the ultimate form of protest. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. I, I it, it depends on the issue, I guess. Um, oh, it, I, I don't really, I don't want to even have that system in place. I know that's the system we live under. That's what yeah. we live in today. Unfortunately, like nationally, I'll never participate in any national election ever. Like I can, I'll take that to my death. Like I'm never going to participate in any national election. I don't believe it. I don't believe they should even exist. Well, or any government should exist, but locally, I think now it, it's it's weird because like I'll go against my beliefs because I hate the six. I think we could win. So I know that sounds horrible to say, but. You get twenty thousand people in one little small area. They, that that will obviously make a difference. Um, but I don't, I don't want us to outright support it. But at the same time, I can't say, I can't say never. Well, yeah, and I I participated in uh, the whole electoral process before. I've been around with all that. I, basically, I don't think it's something worth a lot of time and effort on. Isn't it's worth for me? It's worth the time and effort to, you know, for half a day, whatever, find out who this person is. The other half of the day, go to the damn polling booth, and something like. Other than that, though, that's not. You're exactly right. That this this system, we're not. It's not going to be dismantled by just not touching it. And I'd rather use it for you know to to reduce well, the size. Well, there, there's an argument to be made mm -hmm. that. Um, not everyone would agree with this, obviously, but there is an argument to be made that one, you know, you could theoretically use a system to, to dismantle the system. Now, mind you, that's never worked. That never has worked. Um, it probably never will work. Uh, maybe New Hampshire it will, but the only way I see that happening is if they they get enough people, enough secessionists in the uh, state house uh, to do something about that or like a governor running on running on the platform of secession 
maybe a free stater in 10 or 15 years from now will be uh, running as a, a on a secessionist platform. I'll get behind that. I'll, I'll vote for sure for anyone advocating secession. Um, but uh, other than that, I, can, I can't see myself doing it. Well, yeah, and voting is kind of a non-issue to a certain extent. And the government's going to do what they're going to do regardless of who you vote in. So, I mean... Yeah. Well, and, exactly. And that's that's something that a lot of big libertarian conundrum. It's like, what do I do about this abysmal state of affairs that we call the world? And voting sucks, so what, what can we do? And part of it is just like bitch on Facebook, right? Oh, no, we're keyboard warriors, man. Yeah, we're keyboard warriors. Our there, keyboard so warriors. Helmet with the horns and everything and just go to work. With it. And... That's that's something you can do is just spread the word in everyday conversations, but that still leaves people, for one thing, feeling marginalized because they're they're the one anarchist they know, and two, feeling ineffective because you just just talking is not everything. They can do. Well, one one thing you can do, I mean, at least one thing I like about Free State Project is it's not just. I mean, we we've talked about voting, but that's not the most people nowadays that I, that I seem to be running into that are free state participants are not there to vote and they never are going to vote. A lot of them exactly. are voluntarists and anarchists. Maybe the first rush did, but now that's... that's yeah, the first, that they've evolved past. And I'll be honest, I'll probably mm -hmm. be, I consider myself part of that crowd as well. Um, but at least they're going there and trying to build that free society they want. The fa yeah. They're very active being there and creating a society they want to build is an act in itself kind of civil disobedience because... Yeah. It's not something you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go along and be, do what you're told at the scenario. And that's the that's the real real way. That's the real thing we can all do, and that's why I moved out, is to, you know, what's the, what's the New Hampshire motto? Live free or die. It's not talk free. It's not think free. It's live free. Live in a free way, in a free manner. And that's the real way we can do it. For example, um, everything I do... Like I write, I write for my blog, The Desert Links. I get them published, my articles published in other places. So I do a lot of word spreading as part of my living, right? The other thing I do, I do um, graphic design, graphic apparel as part of the graphic liberation front to help spread the ideas of liberty through a more covert way of just art, in a way. And then um, I teach martial arts. That's my main paying gig, so to speak. And part of that is just training up a strong and independent society that doesn't need so much of a nanny state. And the other thing is it's part of building a business outside of the governmental sphere. And in that, just yesterday I finally managed to we finally managed to start we're starting the Taekwondo school in Derry, New Hampshire, that I work at. We finally got it to where we're moving to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. And so that's probably the first martial art school in the world, or definitely the first in the state, probably the first in the country and the world to accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. And that means that's completely outside of the whole federal tax scheme. And so that's what a lot of people are starting to do around here, is completely transition to a totally different economy, completely outside, build that free society, that free world that doesn't work with the government, it's completely exclusive of the government. And so in it's a lot easier to make the case for no government once you already have a world with no government right there that's doing just fine. So uh, for speaking of Bitcoin, how's, uh, how, how's it feel getting your feet wet with uh, Bitcoin? Uh, it's great. I mean, I already... I haven't done much with it yet. I bought I bought a bunch of drinks. <laughs> so on average, the places that you're going to uh, in Manchester, like how how many of these places actually accept Bitcoin for uh, uh, transactions? Well, not a lot. That's more of the Free State Network. Uh huh. Um, as far as I know, there's only one restaurant slash establishment like that, a bit, like a public one that accepts Bitcoin, which is the Powell Cafe in Newmarket. It's a Brazilian bakery that they accept Bitcoin. It's a quaint little place, and it's a, it's amazing. And now the the free state, there's an exclusive free state or only club that does also accept that. That's not a public establishment. And so we do, we have had our sites on several, several different 
establishments to target with pressure on that. To say, hey, look, we would all come to your session a whole lot more. In fact, we'll guarantee we'll be here every Saturday or whatever if you accept Bitcoin. And that's a pretty easy summary. We're starting to get to know the owners, et cetera. And so expect it to happen pretty soon that there's more and more to add to the list. And also, just with the martial arts school I work for, getting them to accept Bitcoin is just a huge, a huge step. And then before you know it, you can just keep moving from there. There you go. Well, we guys, man, I'm telling you, you need to start an agorist, uh, you know, martial arts school that only accepts Bitcoin. That's, that's what you need to do. You need to, you need to be the first one to start that. The exclusive one. Well, I'm starting, starting December 1st, I'm going to start teaching some self-defense classes at Area 23, the super secret um, free state office space place. Well, it's not really secret anymore. It's just announced it to the entire internet. Exactly. <laughs> it's always, no one knows. I didn't say where it was. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm going to start doing that for Bitcoin. And then before you know it, one thing at a time. And then right now it's still, Bitcoin's still a new thing right now. Um, the the agorist economy of the world and you know, New Hampshire in particular is still kind of new. But yeah. by the time, I'm pretty sure there's going to be something substantial in or already in place by the time 20,000 signers are reached. And certainly by the time 20,000 movers are reached. And at that point, it's probably, it's, things are going to be happening really fast. There's a lot of, uh, of people I've talked to. There's a lot of people who are like fence sitters with this that are completely on board but just have not managed to make that actual transition out of the state controlled economy because it's really hard because you have to find someone who, you have to pay the bills. You have to find someone who will pay you in non-governmental currency. Well, it's not so much just paying for it because you can always use, I mean, that would make it easier, but you can always use your uh, paycheck or whatnot to buy uh, Bitcoin. And now I don't think everyone should go full into it. They should use it for most transactions when possible, but not 100 I don't think you should do 100% in every uh, currency, you know, uh, diversify. But uh, the thing is, like with Bitcoin, in my opinion, you really – like the Free State Project can do a thing where they're setting an example. Like, look, there's there's things you can use Bitcoin for. We're going, we're, you know, they need more and more movies or movers that are going to open businesses that accept Bitcoin. Exactly. Um, and and that way they can get out of the tax system because, to my knowledge, in New Hampshire they aren't taxing Bitcoin transactions. They probably most legislatures in New Hampshire don't even know what Bitcoin is. Yeah, not most yet, not yet, anyways. Most in the world is it's not a really it's not ever as far as I am, I can predict going to be something that will be easily integrated integrable in the in the, in the system as it were. Now that's that's how agorism starts. It's not like oh all of a sudden let's all just create Galt's Gulch. No, it's well hey I want you to, oh you do this I need that done. Um, can I just give you this instead? And then it starts with like a basic barter thing, and then it expands, and then before you know it, you have a small community of friends that trade a lot of service, goods and services between themselves, outside of completely outside of the governmental sphere, and then that grows until you have a whole community, and then a whole again what we're trying for is a whole state that can work that way, and then you can officially then you can officially say okay, I'm no longer accepting government money and it doesn't but you have to work up to it well you know, I know I know right now like with Bitcoin um, mm -hmm. local governments really don't have any clue what it is yet but the feds do the feds always, know what Bitcoin is you know the feds um, I, I don't they can't stop Bitcoin mm -hmm. but they can go after um, Companies, especially if they're based in the U.S., they can try and go after companies that are exchanges where you exchange, uh, um, your, you transfer your money into Bitcoin. They can go after those people, uh, those companies. Unfortunately, I don't agree with it whatsoever. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they can definitely go after that. Unfortunately, but you know, that's another reason to uh, 
support Bitcoin even more. If the feds don't like it, obviously something's good about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, the other thing. How far can you really trace it to be able to shake someone down? Especially it's going to be harder in the hybrid economy. Say you have a bar right? and you have managed to get to the point where half your customers pay in Bitcoin and a half in Federal Reserve notes. And the Bitcoin stuff is obviously off the books or on a different set of books. And what do you, like, at what point do the feds figure out, this, do the, the powers that be, figure out that you are accepting, that you have a large amount of inc income that is completely underground, and at what point do they go investigate, and at what point are they able to tell to exactly locate how much you how much you've actually been getting in that and how much are they able to and then what can they really say about well taxing Bitcoin if it's not money? But well, they then, have they have to admit it's actually money. Yeah, then that then there you go. And then once that happens, then if they admit it if they admit it's legitimately actually money, then the US dollar is pretty much gone. And once that happens, even though the government can still survive through taxing Bitcoin, although again how easily that can be done is just a completely other story. It, at that point, they've lost the invisible tax of inflation, of just printing more money to be able to pay for all this stuff, and not now they're they're back to that square one of having to actually vote for tax increases whenever they want to fund some poor project or whatever, instead of just paying for it on the credit of printing more money, et cetera, et cetera. And so they don't want to do either one. And no, I, of course not. I would not want to do the government right now because things are going to go bad for them pretty soon. Uh, by the way, uh, my wife said she'll start up a agorist uh, nanny agency alongside your uh, uh, your um, martial arts uh, yes. studio. You guys can exchange contacts so you guys both get clients. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> because you can't have a kick in the whole day long. But definitely there's a lot of... Um, the uh, there's a lot of the more hardcore libertarian types don't tend to have children, but I do know of many around here already, and especially I again I yeah there is a demand there is something that could be done with that, and I think that nanny services period tend to be really really easy to do outside of the realm of government. Because oh, there's so many regulations, man. Like, there's so many different regulations if you want to start one up. Well, that's just with the state in general. No matter what business you want to start, there's regulations up the ass for it. Think about the predominant nannies in the world, teenage girls. They don't – they just say, hey, I know, you know, Mrs. Smith has kids and she wants – oh, I know you're all going to pay you to – I'm going to give you some money to watch over my kids. There's no red government red tape involved there at all. It's just – it's a very personal thing. Watch my kids. I'll give you some money. Well, no, even then, I can see the state coming down on that. If the state's going to come down and, uh, you know, put an end to, uh, you know, lemonade stands, they're going to put an end to anything if you don't have a, you know, a license yeah, exactly. to do it. They want to. Can they? Lemonade stands, yes, if there's a physical lemonade stand out there that they can go up to and say you need a permit. But if it's – there's some teenage girl watching some kids – and then at that point, it's, you know, what can they say? Oh, we don't want you to say, well, no, no, it's just I'm the neighbor. I'm watching their well, kid for free. We'll prove it's for free. We'll prove it's not. It's just at that point, you just can't do anything. You just can't nail them unless you get a recorded conversation of every single last damn teenage girl in the whole state just oh, exchanging money over the service. Well, they can. It's called the NSA. They have all that information now. But uh, it's, uh, it's impossible to complete. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, my thing is, well, A, I mean, going, to, going down this rabbit hole, um, I mean, obviously a daycare is a different thing than uh, somebody babysitting. I mean, you have, you have to have a location. Um, you have to have, uh, you know, you're going to have clientele. You're going to have other people probably working under you, uh, assistants and whatnot. You're going to have a, maybe a curriculum or a schedule for, you know, whatever's going on. I'm not an expert on the wife is, but I'm just saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can see them coming down on it. I don't know. I, I, I just want to see people going to the Free State Project and starting businesses without permission, using actually creating a business as a form of civil disobedience. Yes, and they are. And that's 
Dude. Well, I know there's there's already a few out there, which is amazing. I'd like to see more of them. Yeah. Well, that's the amazing thing about the Internet, especially. Is it's grown to the point. The Internet has become such a lifeblood of humanity to the point where now larger businesses are becoming unnecessary. And so they're ne they, you don't need to have a big respected company. You don't need to have your shingle, hang your shingle outside, so the proverbial sign in order to have a good thriving business because now you can, the word of mouth spreads so well, so efficiently, so perfectly online that you can have an entirely clandestine word of mouth business and just feed yourself on that. You can just be, hey, I'm the Nana, we all know. Um, someone messages some group on Facebook about and then they put you in contact with this person and then it's it's all like a friend one-on-one -on -one kind of thing and it's just there's completely no no structure in place for a government to look at and scrutinize and say that should not be happening. You should be giving us money. It's it's going to and there's going to be so many of these. It's not going to be so much one person runs a big daycare. It's going to be it with several employees. It's going to be each of those employees runs their own separate private practice, and then you just can't target that one big host. You know, one thing I'm actually surprised at that the government never kind of ever went after, except for, I guess, in regards to prostitution, is Craigslist. You think about it, Craigslist is like this great, uh, you know, yeah. agorist marketplace, if you think about it. I mean, yeah, the government came down and kind of put an end to their, the prostitute, prostitutes on there. Um, but uh, for the most part, that's a, you know, locally, it's local everywhere for Craigslist. You know, I've sold stuff on Craigslist. I've bought stuff on Craigslist. You know, many people, other people have. You know, I go meet someone, sell my, you know, sell whatever it is because, you know, I'm a phone geek. I go through a phone every couple months. I sell my phone while it's still hot and good uh, and use that funds to buy something else. But, like, um, people sell stuff and services on Craigslist all the time, and they're not paying some fee or not getting permission to do it. They're just yeah. posting an ad. Yeah, and some people do that for a living. Some people just buy and sell things off of Craigslist, like, again, for eBay and Amazon, etc. But on Craigslist, is just a more ground-level thing. They do that for a living because it's just that's how they did their service. Oh, guitar lessons, hit me up, and then they have their own little completely off-the-radar business right there, and all I have to do is find a way, just make sure it's concealable for, from the government. And now that's, again... If you say I only accept Bitcoin, there's another layer right there, or I only accept silver, or I don't accept dollars. And then every form of payment is unique. Like, oh, this person gave me some silver coins, this person gave me this old antique this in exchange for this person didn't exchange its services. And at some point you just can't it just this exposes the ridiculousness of taxation completely. Because you just can't say we get part of your money. Part, part of your proceeds of your doing business without just going completely ridiculous. All you can do at that point for taxation is just say, okay, I'm going to just come into your house and just take some money. I'm just going to raid you like a bandit. And then, oh, wait, now we see, now you see the violence inherent in the system, right? Now you see that they're just a bunch of bandits. And that's what it's no, that's That's all they are. I mean, the, mm -hmm. taxation is nothing more than it's more than robbery, it's enslavement, but it, it's, you know, what's yours is yours. Who are they to come in, tax your business, or tax whatever it is you're doing with your life? Because all income is taxed, because no matter what you're using your your income on, you know, sales tax is still a tax on income, because you're using your income to buy something. You're using your income to buy a service or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a, you know, there's ways you can say, you ways you can phrase that that make it seem semi-legitimate, like okay, this the government is a public good. We need they had a vote. vote. Yeah, we have to like a percentage of that, and it, it looks a little bit more proper when it's like okay, report your income, give a percentage of this in order to sustain society. But then when it comes to the point where everyone has underground type income, no one knows what anyone makes, and the only way the government can survive is by just randomly taking from people. Then it just really starkly, they show up, they ask their protection money, you just you give them money, and they, they have to, you're all, it becomes a much more blatantly mafia, much more blatantly, you know, band of masterless samurai raiding the village, and then, you know, it becomes like a seven samurai thing all over again, and then it, 
they, it all breaks down at that point. It's just it's amazing to me how even like uh, conservatives that are very anti-government, they're like we, we're for low taxes. You know, we don't think we don't we think we're taxed enough already, but they still support the system of taxation in the government to start with. You know, they just don't want themselves to be taxed. And to me, this just seems ridiculous. Well, yeah, uh, and that all goes back to the social contract of if you're going to be here and there's a few different services, we all agree by living here. Well, who will build the roads? Yeah, and then the problem is then what's essential and what isn't, and what's can you opt out? The thing is, there's nothing wrong with the social contract if you can opt out. But the thing is, you can't. It has been decided for, by you by faceless people thousands of years ago or whatever, and then just you, too bad. It's like, oh, we don't. I agree. Like, my whole thing is, and this is where I kind of disagree with some other anti government people, where I, I, I will give the compromise that I, I'd be willing to, if let me opt out of your system, you can have it, anyone can voluntarily be a part of it, just, you know, I want out. I, I want out of it. I want out of the social contract, the system, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I don't want to participate in it. You know, you have, I'll be peaceful with you, you be peaceful with me, just leave me to hell alone. Mm -hmm. And like, you can even say, well, if the terrorists ever come for me and I didn't pay my dudes or whatever, then fine, let them bomb me. And <laughs> Which is a, a substantially harder because you got it in. It's... When you protect the whole community, you get there's the free freeloader thing. But that's the that's the thing is there has at some point we have to come to the collective yeah, as much as I hate that word the collective conclusion that not everyone is going to pay their fair share and that's okay. Is that sometimes in the world you know we all pay for our individual services, but there are some public goods like for example a business needs to pay, they will, they pay the whole parking lot and the road out to their business because they need it for their customers and then people who pay nothing profit from that. We're going to have to come to the moral conclusion that there's nothing wrong with that. That sometimes it just has to happen. You know, he, here's my thing, um, uh, kind of going against liberals with this, about, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll attack a corporate, well first off, a corporation would not exist with no state. This, the corporations only exist because of the state. Um, I thought there But that's not, that's a whole other philosophical argument. My point being um, yeah. is that if this company is so profitable, they're obviously selling a good or service to the community that the community wants. They're getting their fair share from the product or the service. You know, mm -hmm. so they want to attack the same company that is providing the service for the community. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if if they weren't making such huge sums of money, they wouldn't be yeah. providing a good service or a product that would not be benefiting the community. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and the anti-corporate line, it really falls apart unless you're a complete uh, anarcho-communist who just wants to live in a you know, offense to any reasonable anarcho communist out there, but who wants to just live in a, in a prehistoric commune, and that's it. Anyone else has to love corporations to a certain extent because that's who you want to leech off of. Is, is in either you're okay with them keeping all their money because you morally think they're okay to exist, you think that they are, boy, they, they made people happy, that's why they're rich, or if you think they owe you a lot of money, you love them because they're the ones that finance all your social programs. So they well, have all the money. See, the thing is, like, with corporations, I'm going to go down this one. Um, the state allows the people that run those corporations not to be, because it's the corporation that did it, not the actual human being. But that's a whole thing from the state. If we lived in a voluntary society, whoever owns or runs that company would be held responsible for any wrongdoing that that company does, like whether it's polluting something or, um, you know, stealing something from another individual. I don't know what it would be, but if they're doing something wrong, the person that actually put that policy or did that action would be held responsible. Not, you know, we'll, we'll find the company a million dollars or whatever, you know, like none of the, you know, like the whole thing that happened with BP years ago in the, in the Gulf where like, wasn't it, weren't they finding like some 
astronomical number, like 22 billion, or for the cleanup or something like that. Do you think one single person on the their board or the CEOs or whatever, anyone running that company, um, paid a dime of that or faced any kind of uh, um, you know repercussions for it? No, of yeah. course not, because the company took the damage, exactly. uh, the corporation. But that again, that's from the state. You know, if we didn't have yeah. uh, the state. Whoever's running it would be held responsible, not the actual and corporation. And I've actually I've worked in bankruptcy law before, and corporations make absolute legal sense to have because otherwise, in this over-legislated world, you could be held accountable for so many things. Like if you own, if you have like a um, a, a moving business, and you hire some kid to drive your moving truck around. And he runs over a kid, and then you can be you can be taken for all of your worth because it was your car that did that. And so you have to have an, a corporation to protect your personal assets. But that's only because we have a government in place that someone can just convince to come take all your stuff if you. And so corporations are an absolute necessity in this current legal structure, which is again why they exist in the first place. The problem is this current legal structure where you can be sued for whatever, where you can someone can make the case to the powers that be that they're entitled to all your stuff. No, I, I, I completely agree. I, I agree with you. So, anywho, what else is going on in your neck of the world, uh, world man? What's on your thoughts? Well, just living the dream up in here. I mean, it's it's really a very tight-knit community of people. Um, very tight knit society. A lot of stuff can get done. Um, there's a lot of there's a very generous there's a spirit of generosity in here. That's for sure. A lot of a lot of people share what they have very readily. And for example, just a few weeks ago, they helped a new mover move into their house in Ware, and it was a, it was a family of I think four, three or four, and. People like myself, me and drove 45 minutes all the way up there just to help them unload and move for free just because, hey, new neighbor, yay, not even neighbor, new way out there neighbor, and then just a spontaneous order took place right there. Just people showed up, helped them move out. They had the whole, the whole two-story house full of possessions unloaded from the moving truck in under an hour. Just, there we go. By smiling, happy, dedicated people who got nothing in return other than the actual satisfaction of providing a service to their community. And then, you know, I was talking to the owner there. I was like, hey, you got a nice pool there. Hey, so pool party next summer? I says, you know it, we'll, we'll invite you. <laughs> so there we go. All of a sudden, everyone's happy. Everything works out. And there's a whole lot of that going on, not because anything's different here, but just because the kinds of people that want to come up here to make a difference for liberty tend to be committed great people. And right. Once you build I, I, a community like that, then it's you just completely obsolete any notions of well, we have to force people to do this. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we both agreed that good ideas don't require force. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one thing that I kind of noticed that is kind of a stereotype of libertarians and whatnot that we're so individualistic that we don't even want to belong in any kind of community or whatnot. Like, I just want to be, I want to be part of a community that, uh, you know, is nonviolent, that uh, advocates peace and liberty. And I don't want to be part of a, you know, community that thinks they can steal from me, you know? Uh, and that's what I really see from the Free State Project. Well, and that's a, that sort of myth of, um, selfish libertarians is probably one of the biggest obstacles to fence sitters because they're like, well, yeah, I mean, I believe all that stuff, but I care for my fellow man too. And that's the good thing about, man, I'm just totally saying nothing but good things about Free State Friday. Yeah, I know. That's, totally, that's completely fine with me. But once you see this world of people just sharing and everything, and then, you know, like downstairs, there's, you know, Big case of you can get it. There's a big case of beer that shows up in the fridge, and then people are like, "Oh!" And then someone comes, "Hey, I had a couple of them. Here's the money for the like." People just share all the time, and then through the honor code, you know, honestly, like reimburse for that. And then sometimes, "Oh no, don't worry about it. Just it's you know, 
everyone's doing. Everyone, no one takes count of what of you know how much they're owed. It's a very it's it's the whole um, communist paradise thing. Only it's voluntary. It's a whole man. We'll just share in. Uh, you can't you can't drop the communist man. You're gonna scare people away from the free state project, man. You can't drop the c word. Well, I'm saying is the answer to the it's if they did the completely wrong one. They say, well, let's. Let's make a society. Let's make a system that forces all this. It's like no, you don't need that. When you just, when you have coercion out of the way, people come together because people are decent human beings, and that's the all coercive systems of government. The intellectual arguments operate under the presumption that there are enough good-hearted people who can get into government and decide good things for the rest of the people. is in that some people are good enough to make a change in the world. That's how they back up their coercion. But now, if you're, if you're willing to say that there are some people that will be able to take care of us and take care of the common good once put in power, then you're willing to admit that those same people can all, will also act that same way outside of power, in fact, less corrupted by power. And so saying, oh, no, nothing will get done because the people are too selfish. They will not take care of their fellow man. Well, then why are you trying to, through a democratic process, get people to vote for good if they won't do good in their own, in their own, you know, in their own free, free time? And so I think we're finding out really quick through practic through practical applications that here, here we go. People are willing to help their fellow man to live in peace, to trust, to all these peace, love, and brown rice, all that thing. They're willing to do that without the state. In fact, the less that there's a state in the system, the more they're willing to do that. No, I agree. All right, before we uh, put an end to this uh, the show here, I want to point out, when the hell are you going to get your YouTube channel going? I keep, Every time I talk to you, I, I push this on you, and every time I, I, I – literally, I will push you until you actually start putting up content because it's been far too long. Or can I? I mean, I'm about to change locations. As soon as that happens, you're going to start seeing some stuff. That's all I can say. Very soon. Let's Very say soon. By, by the end of November, by the late. The end of November? And it's a month away. You, you got time. Put something okay. up. Do something. Okay. Middle of the month. I'll give, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two weeks. Two weeks, put something up, get it done. Or then you'll send you, a SWAT team? Yeah, I'll, I'll send a SWAT team uh, and a Bearcat uh, to your place and put a gun to your head and force you. Exactly. All right, so where can everyone find you at? Okay, well, I run the Desert Links, thedesertlinks.com. A lot of good stuff there, a lot of cool articles, et cetera, et cetera. You can follow me on Twitter at... The Desert Links. And All right. There we go. There you go. All right. You can find me at Voluntary Rebel on Twitter. Uh, I got a Facebook page for this, uh, for the show, Rebel Love Show. Just go to facebook.com slash the Rebel Love Show. Uh, I'm going to try and do a, at least uh, three to four episodes a week. May have different co hosts, but hopefully Joel will come back on, uh, get some other guests on. It'll be a good time. Uh, if you got any. Questions, comments, leave them in the uh, comments on the YouTube channel. Hopefully, I get this up as a podcast. That's my my goal. I gotta get that going. I, I want to really do this as a podcast as well. Um, but anyways, that's all I got. Uh, Joel, pleasure as always. Uh, keep up the good work in uh, New Hampshire. I'll see you there hopefully soon. And uh, peace, guys.